The most important thing towards a positive network future is network neutrality. Um, it's essentially ensuring that the networks we use are capable of carrying whatever different set of content people can invent. Um, there's a real push right now to essentially allow companies to prefer one type of content over another. The first content we're likely to see this on is voice over IP traffic. And generally, networks run by phone companies, uh, which may be running their own phone services, don't particularly want to carry Skype phone calls or uh, Vonage phone calls. And you're already seeing, we've seen in Canada, a network essentially uh, degrade the traffic of Vonage. This ends up being an enormous problem um, for anyone who's trying to innovate on the internet. If you allow a network to say, okay, I'll sell you internet access, but I'm going to optimize it for my services, and those services include um, video streaming and email, but not virtual worlds, for instance, and then someone comes along and virtual worlds suddenly become very important, you have a whole set of people who are functionally cut off from that corner of the net. What's worked so well about the net so far is the fact that we're all on the same internet. You make the decision what provider to go with, but ultimately you're going to get the same bits. That's now under threat, uh, and that's an enormous danger that policymakers should be considering very seriously. My vision has to do with getting all six plus billion people on this planet um, capable of communicating with one another. Um, and I'm willing to sacrifice a great deal of the high end to uh, grab the pervasiveness of network technology. Um, I'm not especially interested in 3D spaces. I'm not especially interested in flashy animations. I'm not especially interested in being able to simulate physics on a computer. What I'm interested in is the ability to listen to the stories and the experiences of people all over the world talking about what's going on. For me, as I sort of project 10 years in the future, I get very excited about extremely lightweight clients, very interested in the spread of the mobile phone. I'm interested in ways that the mobile phone can be used for generative content. How do you use this not just as a one-on-one -on -one device, but how do you use that as a publishing platform? or an interaction platform. I'm very interested in the aggregation and filtering of content. How do you listen to six billion voices? Someone's going to have to help you sort through it. I'm very, very interested in translation, uh, which is an enormous problem as we start trying to deal with an internet that is not a de facto English internet, but also has enormous Chinese populations growing on and other language groups growing rapidly. I mean, I think the simple answer is no, I don't have a tremendous amount of fear for the network future. Um, I do think some of the new technologies that people are playing with are compelling almost to the point of addictiveness. Um, and I do think that in the same way that I watched some of my friends in college drop out of school playing moos and muds, we're seeing people uh, you know, drop out of life in general sometimes playing massively multiplayer online games. Um, well, I think that's interesting and a little troubling. I don't think it's the sort of thing that one legislates around. I don't think you can sort of prevent people from encountering these things. I think instead it's a really interesting indicator that these games are doing things and providing things that are somehow missing in the rest of our society. And it's a really interesting question. I think if <clears throat> we're finding that people are getting some sort of social stimulus that they otherwise lack online, first of all, at least they're getting that stimulus. Um, I know that a lot of my online relationships are at least as important as my offline relationships. But it's also a really interesting question about, you know, what are the social spaces, what are the constructs that allow people to interact or not interact with the people who are physically proximate to them. So, um, you know, I don't have a whole lot of fears. Uh, I, you know, don't particularly want a positive future in which we're all locked in staring at our boxes. But um, to the extent that I am locked in staring at my box, there are many ways in which my life has gotten better and more interesting. My box connects me to a lot of interesting people in really interesting corners of the globe. As long as this is something that we do, as long as it's a tool that we use in a larger, full, complicated life, I don't have a lot of worries.
two that I would love to see happen in the next 10 years, um, but I'm not sure will happen even within the next 10 years. One is um, truly reliable speech recognition that essentially allows a voice interface to create content. Um, we have all this enthusiasm about podcasting right now, and, and podcasting is very nice and fun, and you can imagine how much fun it would be if I could pick up my cell phone and say a few words and have a blog post out of it. But right now you're creating an audio file, and there's huge problems with those. You want a text transcript for searchability and for translation. The other big one, as I mentioned before, is translation. Um, really good machine translation to the point where I can pick up my phone and I can talk to my friend Isaac Mao and he can speak Mandarin and I can speak English and we're unaware of what language the other is speaking because it's being seamlessly translated and it appears in that other person's voice. That's the sort of miracle type scenario that would have an enormous social impact. Uh, just absolutely enormous. The ability for people in countries that we don't know about and don't pay attention to to report their own news and call attention to situations if they could make the news they needed and, and in the language that they spoke uh, would be tremendously important. Diverse. Um, we're at a conference here in Silicon Valley uh, it's almost all white people. It's almost all men in their late 20s through you know, early 50s. Um, this is the same group, of which I'm a proud member, uh, that's had an enormous amount to do with building the internet so far, building the web as we know it, um, really setting the culture of this space that we all sort of interact in. Um, and this group has done a remarkably job within our ideological and, and other constraints of, of being open to the notion that we're going to share this space. Over the next 10 years, we really are going to share this space. We see this already. If you look at web blogs, there's now more of them in Japanese and in Chinese than there are in English. Um, I'm really excited about what I and a lot of others refer to as the next billion, the next billion people who will be getting on the internet. There's no longer a reasonable assumption that someone on the net speaks English. Very soon, there's no longer going to be a reasonable assumption that that person's skin color is white. There's no longer, soon, going to be a reasonable assumption about who that person is. And that's going to be a real change of pace for the people in this room and the people on the internet as a whole. Uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic change of pace, but I don't predict that it's going to be easy for everybody.